May this video be the starting point for a journey of self-discovery and connection with the love that resides within every human being. Ladies and gentlemen, they say that there are more than 100 zillion organisms in this world, of which 7 billion are human beings. Of these 7 billion, many are born, many exist, and many go away. Not remembered, not to have contributed anything and not without any self-realization. There are only few who are not only fired by the curiosity and get self-realized, but still only fewer of them who can elevate others also on this path to self-realization. For us in Coimbatore, in Tamil Nadu, in India and to many parts of the world. Sadhguru is one person who has influenced how many of us have thought and how many of us are live. And we are extremely fortunate to have him here today. On behalf of all of you, I would like to say a heartfelt gratitude to Sadhguru for accepting our invitation. <clears throat> It's just fortune, I think, that his busy schedule allowed him to be in Coimbatore. On behalf of all of you, can I please request Sadhguru? Jananam Sukadam Maranam Karunam Milanam Maduram Smaranam Karunam Kalevashadiha Sakalam Karunam Samaya Deepate Akilam Karunam Namaskaram. <coughs> good evening to everyone. I said good evening. <laughs> Sadhguru, pranams. Uh, As I... Uh, I'm very... Uh, must be my privilege, I'm with all the doctors here, but... Already Raj Shikhar, uh, Dr. Raj Shikhar told me that I'm not good for business <laughs> No, actually when we were waiting, Sadhguru told me that he has had many fractures, but it all healed by itself. I told him he is not good for our business at all, so <laughs> Sadhguru, so we are having a huge audience of more than 5,000 doctors from more than 18 countries. So, all my questions are going to be many things that the people have asked you, but I'll ask from a medical angle. So, as doctors, this is something that uh, worries us or w makes us wonder. Because we do see patients who seem to be at the receiving end of the wrong end of fate. How do you explain a patient going in a bus sitting on the fifth seat in the center. Nobody in the front four seats get injured, nobody behind him, but he gets grievously injured. And he comes to the hospital and some people get all the possible complications when they go through the treatment. There are others who are involved in major accidents, but something seems to be helping them to get better so fast. It looks like there is somebody one hand telling thou shall live and to the other person you have a bad fate, it's time to go. It's a bad thing coming from a doctor. Yeah, but, but it is a fact <laughs> <laughs> We won't tell anybody. <laughs> 
See, uh, what you call as physical dimension of life is a mechanical process. The very fact that you called it an accident, it means something unexpected happens. So, when two mechanical objects collide, what will break is nobody's guess, all right? That's how it is. That's the nature of physical existence. So we should not write… try to re read any mystical dimensions into a simple mechanical situation, that's one aspect of it. But at the same time, as there is gravity, as there is weak and strong nuclear forces, as there are many physical forces which rule the mechanical aspects of life, there is a dimension, this will… this word has become religious so people will mistake this. Here uh, in Tamil we call it Arul, it's called grace. This entire culture is based on this, that uh, Indian people, wherever they see anybody, somebody says he is a sage, somebody says he is a saint, somebody says he is a yogi, wherever people want to receive blessings, they want to accumulate. Because uh, they understand that either your mechanical parts can work without lubrication and wear out quickly, you know the joints. If there is no lubrication, any machine will wear out quickly. It doesn't matter how good it is. It doesn't matter how well designed it is, how great it is. If there is no lubrication, it will wear out. So there is a dimension which… Uh, there are many words in Sanskrit, but in English generally it passes off as grace. So if you earned grace, if you have become receptive to grace, there is lubrication. Where there is lubrication, there is no friction. So even a collision may not cause much damage to that one. But we should not read this into everything because mechanical objects, <coughs> mechanical processes can happen in so many ways that need not be always seen as, uh, you know, some kind of uh, spiritual or mystical stuff. But at the same time, those who are in grace will not get into that bus either. Mm. But it does not mean just because you have grace, you will not get injured, you will not die. Maybe it's a good thing for somebody to die today. I'm sorry, I'm saying such a thing. I'm saying for a whole lot of people, many things that they logically think are bad, if they examine it carefully in their life, it might have been the greatest blessing in their life. So, uh, I must tell you this story, is okay? Oh yes, I mean we love stories. This happened a few years ago. I like to go into vegetable markets, this is one of my fads. When I'm driving on the highway, if I see a shandy, I will stop, get down and get into the vegetable market. Well, I have no cooking coming, I can't take these vegetables and cook somewhere. But in India, buying vegetables is an art. In our families, they trained us from a very young age how to buy vegetables. For what you must buy, how? <laughs> Different things. When we were young, our families, boys are trained how to buy fish, how to buy meat, how to buy vegetables. For which dish, what kind of vegetable you must buy, this is a big training process. So, I'm well versed in those things, so we… I get down and go around, bargain and bargain, because you must bargain, because it's not just about vegetables, this is a kind of an interaction. So I bargain everything, when they come down to my prayer price, I just give them the money, not take the vegetables and go on, because I have not come there for vegetables, I have just come for the experience, <laughs> just uh, trying my skills. <laughs> So, uh, one day I went in Bangalore city into a vegetable market. A small vegetable shop, very small one. A man was sitting behind it, I just looked at him. He was just a shining being. I… I just looked, my God, what is he doing here? Then he turned and looked at me, our eyes got locked. And uh, I just looked at him and he burst out laughing. I also laughed and went up to him and asked, what the hell are you doing here, selling vegetables? 
Then he said, you come sit here. So he made me sit in his vegetable shop and he told me his whole story. I'll try to make it very brief. He got sick and he got admitted into a general hospital in Bangalore. A general hospital, general ward is acclimatization to hell normally, I'm sorry <laughs> So he was there and every day uh, he thinks he's going to die but he doesn't die one more day, one more day. It goes like this, every day he thinks he's going to die and he doesn't die. After over two months, his wife stopped coming to the hospital. <laughs> she got tired of visiting this guy. He's, he's neither going to die nor to get well. Then the demand for the beds became such, they put him outside in the corridor. With just one sheet, he was in the corridor of the government hospital for another two months. Every day he thought he will die, but he did not die. One day, suddenly he realized something, he sat up. Within about seven, eight days, he walked out of the hospital and uh, became ecstatic and blissful. His wife, his family, nobody turned up, but because earlier he was selling vegetables, he continued to sell vegetables for a living. And uh, after almost three, four years after such an incident, he saw me for the first time and we kind of buddied up. And I said, how? He said, you know, I said, what do you do here selling vegetables? He says, I bless everybody, they must get sick for four months <laughs> So you never know what will turn out as a blessing <laughs> Sadhguru, you said about grace. So if grace is something that is going to actually protect us, how do you accumulate this grace? I mean, do you carry it? Because this is one of the things that is always told to us, that some people carry that grace from their previous birth and do something good now so that you will carry this grace to next birth. Is that so? I, I, whoa, whoa, what whoa, is this? Whoa, 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 you're going away too far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, grace is available to everybody. It's like sunlight. Sunlight is available to everybody, but only those, those who open their eyes will see. <laughs> That's the way it is. But is it not there? Is it there only for me, not for you? There's no such thing. It's available for everybody. It's just that, are you receptive? When we talk about receptivity, see the entire process of yoga, the word yoga itself means this, the word yoga means union. Union means what? Right now in most people's experience, it is me versus universe. This is how people are experiencing life. Otherwise, why continuous anxiety, fear, they think they are fighting for their life all the time, why? They are fighting the whole universe. Individual and the universal. Being in competition with the universe is a stupid thing to do. Hello? <laughs> no? Yes. It's a bad competition to get into. Hello, you must show some sign of life, otherwise I'll have doubts. <laughs> Hello? Yes. What will you do if you're patient? <laughs> what will you do? He has to show some sign of life, isn't it? <laughs> because your orthopedics, uh, if you press on their pain points, of course they'll come alive. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't have such a privilege. <laughs> you versus universe, a bad competition to get into, isn't it? So yoga means this that you consciously obliterate the boundaries of your individuality, that if you sit here, there is not much distinction between what is you and what is the universe. On another level, see as we sit here, this is my body, that is your body. Do what you want, these two things will not become one. This is my mind, that is your mind. Do what you want, these things will not become one. They may overlap on some issues and we may feel that we are one with each other. But my mind is my mind, your mind is your mind, isn't it? But there is no such thing as my life and your life. This is a living cosmos. You captured a little bit, I captured a little bit. 
that's about it. But now we think this is my life and that is your life, there is no such thing. This is a living co cosmos, you've blown a small bubble, somebody might have blown a little bigger bubble. Did you blow so bubbles when you were young? Oh yeah. You still do? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. So when you blew soap bubbles, somebody had this big bubble, somebody else had that big bubble, oh went on saying, this is my bubble, this is your bubble, but poop it went. Once it goes poop, you did not say this is my air and this is your air. Similarly, there is no such thing as my life and your life. There is just a living cosmos. If you capture more life, then you will see, you have more grace. The depth, dimension and scope of your life is determined by how much life you capture within you. It doesn't matter what kind of body you have, what kind of intelligence you have. If you have not captured substantial life within you, you will live a small life, that's how it is. Mm. How do you do this? There are systematic ways of approaching this or Simply by involvement and exuberance, by commitment, people may capture a larger life. By absolutely being committed to something, focused on something, somebody may capture a certain amount of life which is more than what is considered normal. Mm. But yoga has a systematic process as to how to capture life. I can show you thousands of people around me today. <laughs> when they came, they thought they won't do anything significant, half of them, uh, not half, seventy percent of them are dropouts from schools and colleges and everything. But you will see after a few years of sadhana, suddenly they are functioning in ways that you won't believe possible. Recently we had a business, uh, you know, event called Insight, where over two hundred uh, CEOs from across the world are coming and participating. All of them wonder, why our organizations don't run as smoothly and efficiently as yours? I said, that's because I all have all dropouts who are no good for anything <laughs> But they have devotion in their heart, they are devoted to what they are doing, that's all. Because they are absolutely devoted to what they are doing, they may not be MBAs, they may not be from IITs and IIMs, they are simple people, but because they are absolutely devoted, they do wonderful things. So, the question is, how much life have you captured? Always people keep wondering, oh, that guy is not as smart as me, how come he is more successful? You know, this is… this is going on in a whole lot of people's minds who think they are smart <laughs> Yes, always. Why is that guy more successful than me? I am smarter than him. Obviously, your smartness is not working because… Uh, just with one dimension of life, life will not function. The most important thing is how effervescent and large is the nature of life that you've captured. And every one of us have an unlimited access to it. But how much will we take depends on how consciously we conduct our life. Sadhguru, you said about life and that brings a big question what doctors have about life. Now they say we have one trillion cells in our body mm -hmm. and each of these cells is living by itself. And when you say a patient is no more, it's just that the brain dies after two or three minutes, but still a large part of his body is still alive. Mm -hmm. So, and these cells, even when after the patient is dead, you take these cells and those put in of a them, culture. Those of you who are all shaving every day, even after you're dead, we still have to shave you, you know this. Yeah, the <laughs> hair grows. That is why I'm ready, you know <laughs> Yeah, but so what dies when we die? So that brings the question, what leaves us? So where is this life in our body? Is it in our brain, our heart? And what is this life <laughs> you're talking? Is it in the spine or is it in… where does it reside? <laughs> There's so many living people, you can ask them <laughs> Where are they <laughs> I think uh, the religious beliefs have totally screwed up human mind so badly. Uh, wait, 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 wait. 
that uh, people cannot even know what's happening within themselves. They know… they know the geography of heaven. Hello <laughs> So, uh, people know what is the geography of heaven, where is God sitting, you know, how many children he has, when is his birthday, <laughs> everything they know. How come they don't know where is their life? Isn't it ridiculous? Hello? <laughs> because we were told, Swami, about the birthday of gods, but nobody is telling us where is our life <laughs> and what is our life. <laughs> you are life, aren't you? Yes, yes, of course. I hear four people, but <laughs> I'm asking all of you, your life? Yes. You must show some sign. Huh? <laughs> so, if you are life, I'm asking you, are you really life? Yes, yes, yes. So, how come we know so many things and we don't know what is the nature of our life? Now, if you asked why uh, if somebody is dead, still cells, some of the cells are active. As I said, dead bodies are given a shave up to ten, eleven days. Why this is so? What we are calling as life physically is a mechanism on many different levels. There is hardware and there is software. You are core of hardware, bones. <laughs> uh, the software is equally important. Otherwise, how would a cell know that it's a human cell, that it is not a pig cell or a tree cell or something else? How does it know? Because there is an entire software, there is memory, evolutionary memory, genetic memory, karmic memory, there are varieties of memories imposed on every cell in the system so that it never gets confused. If you eat dog food for three days, you will not become a dog, isn't it? <laughs> because the memory is entrenched in this. So there is a whole software. The software package is actually bigger than the hardware, much bigger. And uh, it is energized by what we are considering as a life force. In yoga, we call this prana. It manifests itself in five basic dimensions. There are other forms to it, which gets too complicated. Five basic forms. These are called pranavayu, samanavayu, apanavayu, udhanavayu and vyana. These have different functions. Prana is related to breath, respiratory action and thought process. If the pranavayu depletes, your respiratory action will go away. So immediately doctor checks and says, he's dead. They'll try to pump their chest. If he doesn't come back, he's dead. Respiration and your pulmonary action are very directly connected. Once respiration stops, that process will naturally come to an end. So pranavayu is gone. It's not like one after another they will go. They will go at the same time, but one goes means this is gone. If samanavayu goes, this is in charge of generating heat in the system. So once samanavayu starts receding, the body starts getting cold and it also starts becoming stiff. Once apanavayu starts receding in a major way, then <clears throat> the sensory aspect of it, we must understand this. You may check somebody's breath and declare them dead but they can still feel sensations. There have been any number of cases where people get terrified because a dead body moves a little bit. This has happened again and again, many, many times. That when he's been medically declared dead, there are twitchings in the body that happen in a very mild way because the sensory activity is still on. Still, life is not fully convinced that it's finished. It is still making an effort of its own. When Udhanavayu goes away, then the buoyancy is gone. When I say buoyancy, see, you may weigh seventy or eighty or whatever number of… I'm sorry, <laughs> maybe you weigh fifty or fifty-five kilograms. <laughs> I don't want the ladies to get… Whatever is your weight, 
you don't… let's say you're very happy and alive right now, you don't feel fifty kilograms on you, isn't it? Hello? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it is there. If you stand on the scale, it is there. But when you walk, it is not there, simply because this udhana creates a buoyancy. It makes you less available to gravity. There are yogic practices to activate this. There's a whole school of udan in China, where uh, you might have seen those movies, uh, Hollywood movies, uh, what is that? Crouching Tiger or something, something. What? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So these are udan schools where they have mastery or udana, where they can float around a little bit. Well, little exaggerated in the movies, but becomes lighter, more buoyant body. For a martial arts fighter, to be buoyant is important. There have been many cases where certain ballet dancers and martial arts experts have shown what is physically not possible they have done by leaping up to heights, which all physicists believe is simply impossible. But they've gone beyond that level simply by creating more buoyancy. So udhana is in charge of buoyancy. Once udhana starts receding, suddenly body becomes heavy. Always it was the same weight. Weight does not increase, but you can feel the weight much more simply because udhana is gone. This doctors may know, maybe doctors don't do it, the people who work in the hospitals may know. Carrying a live person and a dead person, there's a Makes big a difference. difference. Simply because udhana is gone, there's, buoyant, there's no buoyancy. The fourth dimension is called vyana. This is preservative in nature. If vyana recedes, even when you're alive, body will begin to rot. There are certain uh, types of snake venoms which can do this. If they bite you, you will not die, but literally parts of the body will start falling apart simply because vyana will recede and it will start falling apart. So, once vyana recedes, the rotting process will begin. There are systems in yoga where we want all the seven to go reasonably together, within one and a half hours we want it to go. In normal death, depending upon the age of a person, how vibrant a particular body is, it may take a long time. When I say long time, up to fourteen hours it may take. Vyana may take up to fourteen days to leave. This is the reason why in this culture you have rituals running up to fourteen days because they feel the vyana may be still there, because when you bury a person, the vyana may be still hovering there, so up to fourteen days. That is the reason why within one and a half hours in this… <laughs> in this culture, that was the rule, if somebody dies within an hour and a half, you must cremate them. But then mistakes happened. When they were still alive, somebody put them on the funeral pyre, so they stretched it to four hours. Within four hours, you must create… cremate. But today, uh, there are issues, all kinds of issues about it. So, uh, people are waiting for one day, two days, daughter is in America, she has to come, she'll come after three days and uh, they will wait. But the idea is, for the one who is dead, we must understand this. You are… do you… you don't diagnose people as death, you declare them dead, right? There's a difference. <laughs> So when you declare them dead, for you they are dead. As far as that person is concerned, in a way, all that's happened is, he's disembodied, he's lost his body. All his life he lived thinking he's a body, never realizing the physical mass that we carry is an accumulation from this planet. He never realized that. When suddenly he slips out the body, he tends to hover around the body because he's lost his discriminatory intelligence. Once you leave the body, the discriminatory intellect is not there, so this tends to hover around that body. So in this culture, we said, the moment we are sure that somebody is dead for sure, you must immediately cremate them because it's good for that dead, so they know the game is up. And it's also good for the living, you will see, if somebody very dear to you is dead and their body is here, you keep on hallucinating. Maybe they're just sleeping, maybe they will sit up, maybe some miracle will happen, maybe something else will happen, you know, this will go on unnecessarily. 
You will see people are crying and uh, big emotional drama is happening, but the moment you cremate them, you will see everybody become silent. Have you noticed this? Always. Because now everybody knows the game is up. It's for the living and for the dead. So about life leaving the system, it is so entrenched. It is not something, poop, it'll go away like this. In stages, it goes away. Because it's in stages it came in, it's in stages it'll go away. But Swami, thank you. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, I'll come to a different dimension. So, the beginning I… you said you're skeptic about everything. And I asked you even about God, you said more so. So, what is your opinion about God? We have a different, I mean, doctors are confused about what is God. <laughs> See, uh, it's very difficult for people to understand this. But people who are with me for twenty-five, thirty years around me closely, even today, I don't have an opinion on them. They are around me all the time, I've seen them in and out, but I don't have an opinion on them. It's very difficult for people to understand this. Every day when I look at them, I look at them fresh. Only when it comes to work, maybe you will evaluate their competence and decide what to do from what they did yesterday. Otherwise, as human beings, I never judge them for what they were yesterday. Because my entire work is this, that, Whatever the hell you have been yesterday, whoever you are… whatever kind of parentage you have, whatever kind of history you have, it doesn't matter. If you are willing, tomorrow something fantastic is possible within this life. It is for that possibility that we work. I don't care who your father is, I don't care who your grandfather is. My concern is not even what you are today. My concern is always looking at what you could be tomorrow. If you're not looking out for that possibility, there's no spiritual process. When I don't even have an opinion on anybody around me, why would I have opinion on the creator <laughs> So, because we are human, because we are human beings, our understanding of life is when we say life, we think it should be in this form. If all these two hundred and twelve bones are there, you will certify this is not life. The two hundred and twelve, am I correct? Two forty-two. <laughs> You've gone up. Two forty-two, is it? <laughs> That's a very important number. <laughs> anyway, if you are capable of causing depression to yourself, I'm saying this not without any concern for your illness or not due to lack of compassion because that is the nature of what's happening to you. If you are causing depression to yourself, you are able to generate substantial amount of intense emotions and thoughts but in the wrong direction. If you don't have very strong emotions, very intense thoughts about something, you cannot get depressed. It is just that you are generating thoughts and emotion which work against you, not for you. So you are strong enough to cause depression to yourself because for you to cause a mental illness for yourself, unless you are pathologically ill, which is just a small number of people, rest are all self-created. Most of them are self-created. A few are pathologically ill, it's… they cannot help it. It just comes from within because of genetic and other factors. Almost everybody here, if we train them towards a certain kind of thought process and emotion and push them a little bit with the outside situations, almost everybody will go lose their mental balance they will become clinically ill. 
they can be driven to madness, I'm saying, because the line between sanity and insanity is very thin. People keep pushing it. You get angry, you're pushing the line. It's a thin line. In fact, when you get angry, you know you're pushing the line. That's why the expression, I was mad at somebody. You're not mad at somebody, you're just going mad. You cannot be mad at somebody. You're just pushing your sanity, the boundaries of sanity and moving into insanity for a certain period of time and coming back. You do one thing, every day you try this, ten minutes a day, try intense anger on somebody. What? <laughs> you will see in three months' time, you will be clinically there. Yes. Just try it if you want, because if you keep pushing the line, you go mad and you come back, you go mad and you come back, one day you're not able to come back, that's all. One day you're not able to turn back, then you're clinically ill. You must understand even if you got angry for a moment, you're already ill. Maybe you don't get the certificate of diagnosis. They don't slap a certificate on you that you're gone, but you are going, isn't it? You think it's your right to throw tantrums? You think it's your right to get angry with people? You think it's your privilege to be depressed so that you'll get attention from somebody? You keep playing this, one day you will not able… you will not be able to turn back. Keep crossing the line every day, one day you will see you cannot cross back. That day you need a doctor. Till then, everybody needed a respite from you, but the day you can't cross back, they get the respite because now they can catch you and give you to your doctor. Otherwise, you're temporarily going mad every day, many times a day. They cannot even send you to an asylum, they have to bear with you, your family, your friends, your people around you. If you get at least truly clinically ill, we can hand you over. There's one temple in Tamil Nadu, you know, where they chain you and keep you. Where there is no hospital, no psychological for ailments, no hospital, there is a temple that somebody created which is supposed to push people back into sanity. So, families just take them and leave them there, they're shackled and left in the temple. You give them some money, they'll feed you and you're just there like an animal, tied up. I think if hospitals were run like this, lot of people wouldn't go crazy. They would maintain their sanity. <laughs> right now it's too deluxe. <laughs> if you make hospital extremely comfortable, it'll become an incentive to become sick. And you have incentives in your life to become ill, right from your childhood. You got the maximum attention only when you fell ill. When you are happy, they screamed at you. When you scree squealed in joy, they screamed back at you, adults. You <laughs> then boo 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 boo. <laughs> when you are a child, physical illness is good because you'll get attention from your mother and father and everybody around you, and you don't have to go to school on that day. <laughs> so you learn the art of falling physically ill. But once you get married you learn the art of becoming mentally ill. Because if you want to get attention, you go sit in a corner, act depressed, people will pay attention to you. So, you pl keep playing this game, one day you're not able to cross the line back, that day you're clinically ill. Unfortunately, in many ways, not just in the way that I said now, 
in many different ways. I would say seventy percent of illnesses on the planet, all kinds, are self-created. Even if you get an infection, there is a way. If you keep yourself in a certain way physically and mentally, the virus and the bacteria will not work the same way as it works upon somebody else. If you set yourself like this, no matter what's happening, anyway, I have to go and do this, this and this, there's no break from that. The last twenty-nine years, I have not been able to cancel one program because I'm running temperature, I got a cold, I got this, I got that. It doesn't matter what's happening, what you have to do, you anyway have to do. You can't turn back on that. Either out of your commitment or you have a boss like that. One or one way or the other, if it happens, then you will see, you will not at all fall sick so often. Because if you have temperature, you still have to go. If it's summer, you still go, right? No, a lot of people don't go. It's a little hot outside, they don't go and work. <laughs> little cold outside, they don't go and work. A little raining, they won't go and work. A snowflake, they will not go and work. This is just weather. So for every change in weather, if you have the comfort of covering yourself in a blanket and lying down, once you create that, your body will learn to fall sick as often as possible. If you just keep it this way, it doesn't matter what it is, anyway I have to go and do what I have to do, you will see your body will just bounce back as quickly as possible, even if it gets the worst kind of infections. So you just have to set the necessary conditions for health, necessary in incentives for health, both for yourself and your children if you have them. Do not set incentives for sickness. If a child is sick, observe him from a distance, never go curl him. He knows that's the worst time of his life and he knows he has to get well soon. And give him the best attention when he is joyful. You will see, he naturally learns from within. His very chemistry will learn that it pays to be joyful, it doesn't pay to be sick. If you make this very clear to your own biology, to your own chemistry and to everybody around you, you will see people will not fall sick as often as they are right now. So set that up for yourself. You will see you will get healthy. If you can turn your mind this way, you can also turn it this way, I want you to understand this. No, no, I am like this because my father abused me when I was seven years of age. If you know all that bullshit, you can as well turn yourself around, isn't it? Time. You must understand, mentally, physiologically, chemically, energy-wise, you must clearly understand it doesn't pay to be sick, unhappy, depressed, it doesn't pay. To be joyful and ecstatic, it pays. If you make this clear to all these people inside, they will all behave properly. An infinite number of doorways. If you are very diligent, you will open a few of them. If you are brilliant, you will open many of them. But if you're truly vibrant, then they will open for you. The process of being successful becomes so complex for people that why they are working towards it is generally completely forgotten and they will start evolving concepts of success, all kinds of concepts. What is being successful? I would like to… How can I tell you a joke? You're looking so serious. <laughs> there was a man in India whose name is Shankaran Pillai. Okay? It's like John Smith. <laughs> His son came to United States. Obviously, an Indian young man means he's a software engineer. 
he went to Texas Houston and started working there. Then he fell in love with a white American woman. He struggled because back home this love affair is a crime. He struggled and struggled, then one day told his mother, then the mother informed the father and the father exploded. <laughs> he went back home to convince him, didn't work because in India, if you have to get married, they're tracing your family tree for five thousand years <laughs> They're looking at the genetic purity of the person that you're marrying. So somebody from somewhere else, a white woman from America, how can you marry her? What do we know about her genetics? Where does she come from? What is her lineage? Da, da, da. So no way to convince, he came back. And of course, when he came back again, he fell in love and they went ahead. Then the father disowned. Shankaran Pillai just disowned his son, I have nothing to do with you. But years went by and they had a boy. And the boy's picture from the day he was born, it was on the Facebook and the wife sticks it in his face and the little baby and it's growing up every day and all the things. Slowly, you know, you have disowned the son but the grandson is a different matter. Slowly, within a matter of one, two years, he completely fell in love with this little baby that he has not seen. Things happened and people started coming from America, those who were traveling. Oh, you must see your grandson. You not seen him? Oh, you must see him. This is the fruit of your life. Slowly it caught him. Then he decided he's not going to see his son's face. He'll come to America and only see the grandson's face. <laughs> and of course he's not going to look at that white woman. Then he came to America and a seven-year-old boy, full of energy, they're living on a small ranch, he's all over the place doing all kinds of things. He completely got washed away by this little fellow. Then this little boy one day said, Grandpa, come, I'll show you my archery skills. He took him to the barn inside and he went into the barn and there he saw eight targets all of them with the arrow in the bullseye. Shankaran Pillai looked at it and then he thought, oh, this is my grandson. He thought of all the great legendary archers of India, you know, Arjuna and Ekalavya and… Uh, and he saw the future, all the Olympic gold medals falling from the sky. Then he asked, from what distance did you shoot? The boy said, from twenty yards. What? From twenty yards, eight targets, you shot them dead on bullseye? How do you do this? Then the boy said, Grandpa, I first shoot and then paint the target <laughs> So, <laughs> these concepts about being successful can be very crippling. And I have continuously been with people, they've reached a certain point of success and their concepts of success are not fitting, their life is not fitting into their concept of success and it's breaking it and they think something is going wrong. It is not going wrong, they're just getting better, situations are pushing them on, but their concept is breaking up so they're suffering their success. You will see any number of people going through these kind of things. When we <clears throat> Talk about success. I'm sure all of you must be already having plans as to how to unfold this success in your life. Hmm? Make your plans. Plan is good, but plans again can get caught up in things because you plan from what you know today. Nobody can plan from something that you do not know. You… your plan means it is an exaggeration of today as a tomorrow. Right now you're here at a certain level, now you think, my plan means this must be ten times more in this many years or whatever, or hundred times or million times or whatever. But plan is just essentially an exaggeration of what is today. Maybe there is a certain uh, logic to it, there is a… maybe there is a certain 
understanding of the logistic attached to it, but essentially it's an exaggeration of today. That means in many ways it's ruled out whatever other possibilities which are not yet in your experience. In Pennsylvania, you heard of the Pennsylvania floods? Pennsylvania has floods, you know. It once happened, a big flood came and uh, water started rising in a small town and it rose up to the, you know, the house is getting submerged. So two young boys got onto the roof of their house and they were sitting there. And then they saw a hat going up and down and up and down in front of the house. One of the boys asked, what is that? Why is that hat going up and down? In? So the other boy said, don't worry, it's my dad. Yesterday night he got into a fight with my mom and took a vow, hell or high water, I'm going to mow that lawn. <laughs> so plans can be debilitating. It's good to have a plan, but it's more important that you have a purpose. If you have a purpose, plans will evolve, things will happen, plans will fall apart, new things will come up. Whatever has to happen will happen. If you hold on to a certain purpose, other things will just serve that purpose. But if you are very committed to a plan as such, then plan can become a, a blueprint for restriction. It is also a possibility. It's all right to hold a plan, but you must hold a plan at a certain distance. You shouldn't get identified with the plan. The process of success <coughs> See, essentially success is a desire in every human being. You can put some fire into it and make it your passion. But if it becomes a need within you that you must be successful, otherwise you will suffer, then you are heading for a problem, a serious problem. Our passions can turn into poison. If we become… if we start becoming resentful for the non-fulfillment of those passions, when I say turning into poison, today there is substantial medical and scientific evidence to show that uh, if you become resentful, when you resent something, when you are angry with something, when you are frustrated with something, we can medically today check, we can do a little bit of blood work and show you, you are actually putting poison into your system. These are poisons that you drink and you hope somebody else will die. Life does not work like that. If you drink poison, you die and it's fair. <laughs> it's very fair, isn't it? If you drink poison, you must die. I drink poison, I want him to die. It doesn't work like that <laughs> So these emotions always take away the fundamental ability. See, there is something called as a genius in a human being. Every human being has it, every human being touches it at some moment of life. But the question is, how often do you touch it? That's a question. You sparked once in your lifetime, that's not good enough. You must be sparking all the time, isn't it? What is genius? There are many ways to look at it. One simplest way to look at it is, <clears throat> when we say intelligence, we are always thinking logical thought. Now, logical thought will be meaningless probably in another twenty-five years because your computer may be able to explore all the permutations and combinations of logical thought much quicker and better than you can do. So touching the genius means there's another dimension of intelligence within you. What do you have for breakfast? Chicken and salad. See, he ate a chicken. Over the afternoon, this chicken has transformed itself into a human being. If you ask Charles Darwin, how long does it take for a chicken to become a human being, he would talk in terms of millions of years. Here he is. Over the afternoon, he transforms a chicken into a human being. So there is an intelligence here, there is a competence here which is capable of what nature did over a million years like that over the afternoon. Only thing is, 
this is an unconscious… unconscious state of intelligence. Whatever is unconscious, if the necessary striving is there, you can make it into your conscious process. In your conscious process, if this intelligence, even a drop of this intelligence is available to you, suddenly life will spark like it's a magic. What everybody slogs for, you can just simply do it. Now when I say intelligence, always people would think this. If you say intelligence and ask them to show in sign language, they'll also always say this, isn't it? They'll not say this or this or this or this, but one cell in your body is doing more activity than your brain could ever do. One molecule of DNA is doing so many millions of functions in a minute that you can never ever figure it out, yes or no? So in yoga, in the yogic systems, in the yogic sciences, we never look at anything as mind, there's no such thing as mind. There is a physical body and there is a mental body. So you learn to think, think through your body. You know, it's a short session, it's not an area that we should enter right now, but uh, I have to tell you this, there are many things personally that I do at the same time. Now people come and tell me, just now I'm entering the session, somebody comes and tells me, Sadhguru, these building plans have to happen because uh, we do everything ourselves. Now by the time I get out, I'll have the building plan ready as I'm speaking here because twelve to fourteen channels actually keep going on in my head. It is not just in the head, you learn to think, think through your body. Learning to think through your body will never give you a headache, that's the best part of it. <laughs> Now, all these responsibilities and thousand things happening at the same time, won't you get stressed? There is no such thing because you use a deeper dimension of yourself and everybody is capable of this and everybody has it. You may not have the same level of intellect as somebody else has. That is always subject to person to person. But all of you eat, you, if you eat a carrot, you can digest it. That means you have another dimension of intelligence, yes? If you set up the necessary situation that everything that's there within the system is available for you, success is an assured thing for that person. Eighty-four is a significant number today in our lives, whether we are aware of it or not. Why eighty-four is significant is, this existence has passed through eighty-four uh, happenings. Eighty-four times it has happened, this is the eighty-fourth time. Today modern science proves that the whole existence is just vibration. It's not my invention, it is a scientific fact. Where there's a vibration, there has to be a sound. Yes? Is it okay? I'm trying to go logically step by step. There are other ways to go. Just with this I can make you know it in a different way. But uh, we want to go step by step. Where there's a vibration, there is bound to be a sound. Is that so? So, you're not just a vibration, you're a sound. A noise. Those who are making the sounds and those who are not, all of you are just one piece of sound. This is what modern science is telling you. And somewhere way back, somebody told you, first there was a word and the word is God. Hmm? You know, they told you a long time ago. A sound is a word, isn't it? A word is a sound rather. Right now if I say yes, because you know English language, you are attaching a certain meaning to it. If you did not know English language, as far as you are concerned, I'm just making a sound, isn't it? Because you don't know their languages, you are thinking they are making some crazy noises. No, they are saying something.
if I speak in a language that you do not know, you would naturally think I'm making some crazy sounds, isn't it so? If I speak right now in Tamil or Kannada or Telugu or some other language that you do not know, you would think I'm making some… You don't know whether I'm really speaking a language or making up some nonsense, isn't it so? Yes. So a word is just a sound. So they said that word is God because anybody who has looked at the existence closely can see that what you call as creation and what you call as a creator cannot be separated. If you separate it, creation will cease to exist. Unless it's constantly supported by the source of creation, not for a moment can this creation process go on. Because creation is not a done thing, it is an ongoing thing, yes? Are you an ongoing thing or you a done thing? I hope you are not a done thing. You are an ongoing process. Without the involvement of the source of creation, how would the creation be an ongoing process? It is constantly involved. It cannot be separated. So it is because of this, they said, uh, First there was word, that means from total unmanifest existence, when it began to manifest, the first thing that happened was sound. Even the scientists agree it was a big bang. A bang means a sound, right? In India, it's very beautifully expressed. The first and only one god who existed in that part of the world was Rudra. Rudra literally means one who roars, a roarer. So why they called him Rudra is… that is the beginning of creation because it's a roar. The scientists call it a bang. Now, the scientists are withdrawing the bang theory, that one big bang theory and they're saying, there were series of bangs. So one very popular physicist right now, who's written very popular books, recently he wrote a book, I didn't read this, I met him <laughs> He wrote a book called Endless Universe, Yes, endless universe. Always science has believed that everything has a beginning and an end. Now physicists are talking about an endless universe. The yogic system has always been talking about an ever-expanding universe. For the first time, top-level physicists are beginning to recognize that there is no beginning and an end, it is an endless universe. It is a popular theory going on right now among the scientific community that universe may be endless. So when I was in conversation with him, I asked him, is it possible that it was not a bang but it was a roar, a continuous roar? He thought about it, he looked at many things and then he said, it's possible. Maybe it was not just a pain, it was a roar. It didn't happen in one instant, it roared for a certain length of time and slowly creation began to happen. So the first form, the first god was known as the roarer. Rudra means the roarer. So I asked, how many times do you think he could have roared? He said, we cannot say. We cannot say because we have no way of knowing 
how many times, but obviously he's roared more than one time. Then I said, someday if your research takes you there, keep this as a guide point. He has roared eighty-four times. He asked, how do you know? On what basis are you saying? I said, by looking into my system, I am saying, creation has roared eighty-four times and it will roar further, many more times, a maxim maximum of one hundred and twelve times it will roar. When it roars the last time, then there will be no beginning and end, it will be a perpetual creation. That's too far, but I told him, you hold this eighty-four as some kind of a guidepost and you have machines and calcul mathematics, I didn't learn one plus one how much. You learned all those things, you work on this someday. Someday if you arrive at a number, you will arrive at this number, it will be eighty-four. How is this possible? he asked. I said, uh, see if you cut a tree today, people look into the rings of the tree and talk about in the last thousand years when a drought happened, when excessive rain happened, when a fire happened, everything, right? If you cut into this system with your awareness, the very history of this creation is written into this one. Eighty-four times the creation has rolled, we are in this eighty-fourth roar. What has happened as a result of that eighty-fourth roar is where we are. Out of the eighty-four creations that have happened, eighty-three have happened, this one is happening. Out of these, as creation is happening, ongoing, the dissolution also is ongoing. So the dissolution process started for some creation and they started dissolving and dissolving and dissolving. Out of this, only twenty are still in the process of dissolving, in different levels of dissolving. The others are completely obliterated, except you can look at them in your awareness, looking at this creation because in some way it contains the residue or the experience of all that. Just as you carry your experience of life into everything that you do, the process of creation also has been carrying the experience of every creation into the next one and the next one, though they're completely different, though they may be completely different. Say, you went to school and played uh, soccer and uh, that was twenty-five years ago. Now suddenly it happened, you were forty-five years of age and uh, a burglar entered your house. When a burglar enters your house, you are not going like this, <laughs> you will go like this. Because your soccer game, suddenly something that you have completely forgotten, somewhere it is there in your system, it pops up. You kick the burglar like a soccer ball, not like a, a karate cake or a calorie pie to cake or something else. So the experience, you might have played soccer just for a month, maybe three months, but that experience, somewhere the residue of that experience is still ingrained in you, and it finds expression somewhere else in a completely unrelated space. This is the way you're growing all the time. This is what we're calling as karma. So this is the individual karma, what we're talking about. But there is a universal karma, there is a karma of the creation itself, because creation itself is a karma, isn't it? The act of creation, is it not an act? Act means karma, it is a karma. The residue of that karma he is always moving into the next phase of creation and the next level of creation. Like this, totally eighty-four creations have happened or eighty-three have happened, eighty-fourth is on. In that, the older ones have managed to completely dissolve, they only exist in terms of experiential imprint in the next one, but they don't have a living status. But the twenty behind this, 
are still having different levels of living status. Some are become very, very wispy, some are little stronger, some are little stronger, some are almost real like this. They're almost like this, but they're in the process of dissolution. Their active process of creation is not happening, that's all dissolution means. See, right now what death means for you is, when you're a child, the number of new cells that you're producing, if let's say in a year you're producing hundred billion cells, when you become thirty-five, it is dropped a little bit. When you become forty-five, it's dropped a little bit. When you become fifty-five, it's dropped further. When you become seventy-five, it's dropped further. A time comes when what you're producing and what is dying, what is dying is more than what you're able to replace. So this is how old age is happening. Exactly the same process is happening with the creation. The dissolution is always happening. Even here, dissolution is always happening, but new creation is happening, so it's vibrantly on. That new creation dwindled and stopped. So over a face of time, over a period of time, this just went down. Only dissolution started happening and then after some time, only memory imprints are left. No living imprint is there. So in this… in this sense, only twenty-one are still having a… some kind of an existence. The other remaining uh, whatever, sixty-three, is that? Sixty-three, they're completely gone. You cannot see them anywhere, it doesn't matter how you see, but you can see them as memory imprints within your own system because that imprint and that experience is still here. This one is a real thing, everything else in receding order, they're active. In this, there are two. In the current one, there are two. One is the physicality, which carries the memory of everything. Another is the source of creation, which is the basis of the future. Either you can let your past become the future. When you allow your past to become the future, we look at you and say, it's her karma. When we say it's her karma, what it means is, she's allowing her past to be her future. There is no fresh possibility in her, that's what it is. When we look at someone and say, karma, We are just saying, they are allowing their past to become their future. There is no future for them really, it will repeat itself. So when you say, I'm working on a spiritual path, what you're trying to say is on one level, the statement that you're making is that you do not want your past to repeat as future. You do not want your life to be cyclical, you want your life to go forward. You don't want to be part of the cycle. The last chant that you were singing just now, is punarapi jananam punarapi maranam, means this cycle, I want to break it somehow. Because once you get into a cycle, once you get into a circular moment, you are not going to go anywhere. If you say somebody is going in circles, what does the expression mean to you? It simply means he's not getting anywhere, isn't it? So when we say it's his karma, that's what we're saying, he's not going to get anywhere because on the circle, he thinks it's a new journey, it's a new journey because he has very short memory. Everybody is in a state of dementia. What is before his mother's womb or what is in his mother's womb also he does not remember. They are in a state of dementia, so the circle looks new. Every time they go through it, it looks new. They are like animals in a loop, you know, in a circus they put animals on the loop. This is just like that. In India, particularly in the yogic culture, probably it's there in somewhere in the… maybe it's in the Yoga Sutras itself, this example. They are compared to the bullocks at the oil mill. What they do to the bullocks in the oil mill is, they blind them, that means they blindfold them. They tie something over their eyes or they tie everything like this and just leave this. 
and it's on an oil mill. As far as the bullock is concerned, it thinks it's going somewhere. It's like you go on a treadmill, it feels like you're going somewhere, but you're not going anywhere. That is karma. So, this dimension that you're looking at right now is in two levels. One has happened, another is happening. So the eighty-three of them have happened. If you want to talk in numbers, the eighty-third one is happened but still happening. In a residual way, it is still happening. Your birth has happened. Is it happened? Your birth happened but still happening, isn't it? Your death also has happened but still happening. What I'm saying? Your death is a foregone conclusion, isn't it? It's already happened. The moment you were born, your death happened. First step towards your death happened, but still happening. You're waiting for it to be complete or you're wanting it to be delayed. But it is happening, isn't it? And it's already happened. So, there's another dimension within you for which the birth has not happened, nor will the death happen to it. Only if you touch that dimension, you have something called as a future. Otherwise, you have just karma. Karma means you're repeating your past as future. You may be changing the color, you may be changing the style of how you do it, but still the same stuff, nothing different. Same stuff what the caveman is, was doing, you're still doing the same stuff. Style and capability might have changed, but it's the same stuff, isn't it so? This is like anchor. This is an anchor. You've thrown an anchor and you're trying to move your boat. At the most, it can only go in circles, isn't it? So we are trying to pull in the anchor or cut the rope which holds us to the anchor so that next time we power, it will go away. So the whole spiritual sadhana is based on this, that you want to become free. Free does not mean you have to forget but you have to become free from the memory which rules you. And the memory is not just in your mind, every cell in your body ca carries memory. This much is very clear to us through genetic science and other things. You are carrying the memory of your forefathers and you're still behaving like them. You're still having a nose like them, look at this. Unless you had a nose job done recently. Yes? There are many, many symbols or there are many, many uh, aspects in the body which clearly say that the memory of these eighty-four creations are still there in your body. It is there in every atom in the existence. So what you're trying to cleanse is, you want to cleanse it from the memory because this memory binds you. This memory gives you a sense of belonging. At the same time, this memory binds you, it doesn't let you go. So when you do sadhana, you're trying to cut everything because without cutting that, without cutting your anchor, you're not going to move ahead. So why this memory is holding me back? It is that memory which has given integrity and stability to your body and the structure of who you are right now. Without that, without this memory, this body couldn't be created. Without the memory of a single-celled animal being within you, Without all that information being carried through the evolutionary process and you sitting here, without that memory, this body cannot be structured and held together. So memory is not your enemy, it is just that you don't know how to hold it. You are into it, that's a problem. You are into it, now you want to get out of it, you want to make use of the memory, but you want to… you don't want to be used by your memory. That is spiritual sadhana. You want to have a future which is different from your pasts. See you soon for more discoveries and learning.
Don't forget to subscribe and invite your friends to be part of this community of mutual growth.